Please join me in standing as I read our gospel lesson, which comes from the gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, reading in Christ's name. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished, for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon, and after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. And so for this Lent season, I always like to try to, to pick a theme or, or a, a series, and the series is actually going to be on this verse. And so we'll use verses 31 through 34 through our, the entirety of our Lent season, looking at seven or six, sorry, six verb phrases that really talk about the entirety of God's mission through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we've got going up to Jerusalem is the first verb phrase. Um, will be accomplished. All that the prophets had spoke is the second one. Delivered over to the Gentiles will be the third one. Mocked and shamefully treated will be the fourth one. They will kill him is the fifth and the sixth. He will rise. These six verbs remind us that God has promised salvation even before the foundations of the world was even laid. Before the first sin in the Garden of Eden. Through Adam and Eve and Satan's deception, God had a plan in place. This salvation would come through the prom promised Messiah, God's anointed servant, and he would be and become the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so today we look at the first verb phrase, going to Jerusalem, and we begin to see how Jerusalem is very vital and that God promised salvation to and through the nation of Israel, beginning from Jerusalem and going out to every tribe, every nation, every language, and every tongue. For salvation was promised to Jerusalem, but it was always intended for the entire world. And for that, I say, thank you, Jesus. Pray with me, please. Lord, I thank you for this text. And as we look at these six verb phrases that really describe the entirety of Christ's mission, Lord, I pray that you would continue to work that heart of humility, that heart of thankfulness and gratitude for what Christ has done. May every word that proceeds from my mouth be from you and not from me. May it be in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray all of these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said, Amen. And so Jerusalem has always been central to the promise of salvation, the salvation that God progressively revealed all throughout the Old Testament scriptures. The prophet Micah revealed that the Messiah would suddenly appear in the temple in Jerusalem and that he would bring God's justice and his salvation and it would begin in Jerusalem and then go out to the entire world. As Adam and Eve fell prey to Satan's deception in the Garden of Eden, humanity was infected with that sinful nature. Each one of us is born sinful and separated from God. Each person born after that moment until Christ comes again is born in need of salvation. As God revealed himself to Abraham, a man who actually worshiped false gods, he asked Abram to leave his homeland, and then God established through Abraham a heritage, a nation, and a conduit by which the promised Messiah would come to and through. His love, his guiding hand, was always with the nation as they were chosen and set apart for this very specific and very miraculous purpose, a nation that would bring forth God's salvation to the world. As Israel was further established through the ministry of Moses and Joshua, the promise of redemption and the promise of the Messiah continued to be progressively revealed to Israel. Through King David, God revealed that the promised Messiah would be a king, but not just any king. He would be the king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords just like we read about in Psalm 24, a psalm that King David wrote concerning the Messiah. God revealed that this king would not only come from the lineage of Adam and Eve, not only from the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
but the promised Messiah would come forth through the lineage of King David, and he would be the one to rule and to reign according to God's holiness and God's righteousness, and he would do so forevermore. The Messiah would be a king who would, be, who would come and establish God's perfect and eternal kingdom through the salvation that God had promised to and through the nation of Israel. As Israel became entrenched with sin after the death of King Solomon, they continued in their sinful behavior and they became entrenched with this love affair of sin. And they began to spiral into moral degradation and wickedness. God sent forth prophet after prophet after prophet to proclaim to the people of Israel to repent and to turn from their sin. Unfortunately, many did not. For those who remained faithful to God's promise, for those who remained faithful to God's will, that promise of the Messiah, as was proclaimed through these prophets as well, was an incredible source of hope and encouragement. Yes, these prophets called the people to repentance, but they always also reminded the nation of Israel of the incredible covenant that God made to and through the nation of Israel, the promise of a Messiah. Isaiah was one such prophet. In chapter 40, as he's speaking about the Messiah and the word he and him, as we will hear, is that promised Messiah. And this is the good news. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald of good news, lift up and fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Isaiah revealed that this, this servant, Messiah King, would come in the strength and power of God, but he would come as a shepherd. And he would come as a gentle shepherd, continually guiding and calling his sheep home. Isaiah revealed that salvation would be in Jerusalem, begin in Jerusalem, and that Jerusalem would be the herald of God's salvation to the world, the proclaimer of the good news of the promised Messiah. But the really good news, and I've said this before, but I think it bears repeating, that yes, this salvation was promised to and through the nation of Israel, but the salvation that God promised, beginning with Adam and Eve, continuing through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, continuing to be more focused with King David was always meant for the entire world. Now, I know we're not really supposed to say that, that hallelujah word, but I say thanks to God. Thanks be to God. Salvation would come to and through the nation of Israel, and it would begin in Jerusalem. Isaiah further revealed that the promised Messiah King would be a shepherd. He would be the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. The wonderful promise of the good shepherd of Jesus Christ. Isaiah also writes in chapter 53 that this good shepherd would willingly bear the sin of the world. He would be God's servant, capital S. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his stripes we are healed. As God's chosen people continued with their love affair with sin, God's judgment fell upon both the northern and southern kingdom, and the southern kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Babylonian Empire. Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed as well and a remnant of God's faithful people were deported to a foreign land. Faithful ones like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, maybe better known to us as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Faithful people like Ezekiel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel. For God's faithful remnant, the promise of the Messiah would continue to be a great source of hope, comfort, and encouragement as they were in held captive in a foreign land. As recorded in chapter 9 of the prophet Daniel, 
Daniel says that Jerusalem would be rebuilt one day and God's anointed, God's Messiah would appear in Jerusalem. Daniel also revealed that this anointed one, this promised Messiah would come like the son of man, fully human. But yet he was called the ancient of days, eternal, no beginning and no end. The Messiah would come as a human from the lineage of Adam, Eve, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and King David, yet this anointed one had no beginning and no end. He was truly the ancient of days. In a veiled manner, Daniel revealed that the Messiah would be fully human, yet he would also be fully God, a reality too marvelous for our human comprehension. After the nation of Israel was released from their deportation, they returned to rebuild Jerusalem as well as the temple. The promise of the Messiah and his salvation again continued to be a great source of hope for all those returning to rebuild what the Babylonian Empire had destroyed. The prophet Zechariah revealed even more concerning this wonderful Messiah that would come. He says in chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Do you see how important Jerusalem is in the promise of God's salvation? Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the fowl of a donkey. The Messiah king would come in peace to shepherd his flock and provide salvation to the people of Israel. In Zechariah chapter 12, and just a couple chapters later, he reminds us that the salvation will manifest itself again in Jerusalem. In fact, the prophet reveals that this Messiah who comes from the house and lineage of David will be pierced outside of Jerusalem. As it, and that chapter ends, we see the result of the pierced one talked about in chapter 13, verse 1. It says this, On that day, the day that this Messiah king would be pierced, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. It reminds me of one of my favorite hymns. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood. They lose all their guilty stains. Ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply. His redeeming love has been my theme and shall be until I die. This is the great source of hope. It is the greatest source of hope the universe has ever known. It is a well that won't run dry. It is an inexhaustible source of salvation and the promise of eternal life for any and all who believe. Again, it begins in Jerusalem and will go to the entire world. As Jesus was born the Messiah in Bethlehem, just as prophets predicted hundreds of years before that event took place, he who is the King of kings and Lord of lords arrived in an emptied and humiliated state as Philippians chapter 2 remind us. Jesus, he who is the second person of the triune God, emptied himself of all rank, form, or privilege as God, was born fully human in a manger, and he suffered with us and for us as one of us in order to redeem us. This is the Savior that we serve the one who is the promised Messiah progressively revealed all throughout the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus is the second person of the triune God, the promised Messiah, God's faithful suffering servant, who is our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer, who lived the perfect life that we could not, who paid for the totality of our sin on the cross of Calvary and rose from the dead three days later because the grave could not hold him. He is the head of the church who he has made proclaimers of this salvation and has made that salvation available through the proclamation of the holy gospel of Jesus Christ. And that should be a privilege and an honor for each one of us. Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith, who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as Jesus was about to ascend at the right hand of the Father, he said this, and this kind of brings it all back to Jerusalem. Jesus says this, Thus it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. 
You are witnesses of these things. You and I are witnesses to this great reality. And yes, it began in Jerusalem, but it continues through our hearts and minds, through our lives, through our congregations, through our life choices, through our repentance, through our intentional seeking of the Lord to cultivate a heart of repentance with humility, thankfulness, and gratitude. It began in Jerusalem, but that proclamation continues to go out to every tribe, every nation, every language, every tongue. This is our honor and our privilege. May we never lose sight of that reality. Lord, I thank you for this text, and I thank you for these six verb phrases that we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks. Lord, I pray that you would truly birth that heart of sincere repentance for our sin and our sin nature, for it was our sin that sent you to the cross of Calvary. Lord, I pray that you would also birth alongside of a humble, repentant heart, a gratitude, a thankfulness, an awe, and a wonder for the great Savior that we serve. May we never take these precious things for granted. I pray this in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said,